Ladies and gentlemen, I am Professor Gareth Miles, Head of School of Economics here at the University. On behalf of the University of Adelaide, I welcome you to the 2018 Joseph Fisher Lecture. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge the Ghana people, the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains and the land on which the University of Adelaide's campuses at North Terrace, Waite, Fibarton and Roseworthy are built. I also wish to acknowledge the Fisher family's continued support of the lecture series. The family's representative this evening is Mr. Peter Fisher, who is the great, great grandson of the original donor, Joseph Fisher, and we are very pleased to welcome him here to the lecture this evening. I would also like to acknowledge Lindsay Carfew, who is an economics alumni and donor to the School of Economics in University, Stuart Hocking, the Deputy Chief Executive, Department of Treasury, Professor Mike Brooks, Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Vice-President for Research, Professor Jonathan Pincus, Visiting Professor and former Head of School, and Professor Kim Anderson, School of Economics and Editor of the Fisher, series, uh, Fisher Lecture Series book. The proceedings for this evening will commence with our Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Professor Mike Brooks, introducing Professor Paul Johnson, who will deliver the 2018 Joseph Fisher Lecture. Professor Johnson will take a few questions from the floor before the event is concluded. I now invite Professor Mike Brooks, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, to come forward and introduce our 2018 Joseph Fisher Lecture. Thank you so much, Gareth, and, uh, and uh, good evening, uh, distinguished guests, and uh, I would also pay uh, a special mention to Mr. Peter Fisher, uh, descendant of, uh, of Joseph Fisher, after whom the lecture is named, of course. Uh, it's great to see you all here to, uh, to this very special event. The Joseph Fisher Lectures in Economics and Commerce have been presented at the University of Adelaide since 1904. Uh, and so this is one of the university's longest running lecture series. So this lecture and a medal for the top accounting student each year were established with a £1,000 endowment to the university in 1903 by the prominent Adelaide business, businessman Joseph Fisher. I, uh, I should have uh, calculated what £1,000 in 1903 would be worth now. I'm sure some, someone has it at their fingertips, but a hell of a lot, I imagine. Uh, and uh, and the prizes, the, the, the lecture and uh, and, and the uh, the, pro the medal has endured now for 114 years, and uh, that's fantastic. The University of Adelaide and the School of Economics has been proud to host a long list of eminent speakers since then to this lecture, including former Australian and New Zealand Prime Ministers Robert Menzies and Michael Moore, and a host of high-profile economists and economic commentators. Plenty of seats down the front here. Over the past three years, we've heard from Bruce Chapman, the architect of the Higher Education Contribution Scheme, Professor John List, leading expert on experimental economics, and Professor Alison Booth, Professor of Economics and Public Policy Fellow at the ANU, uh, highly regarded in the labor economics and public policy spheres. Tonight, we have the privilege of hearing from Paul Johnson, an eminent British economist who, as director of the Institute of Fiscal Studies, is often called upon to make sense of fiscal policy announcements for the public and to hold the government and opposition to account. He's often been uh, called the real opposition to government. <laughs> Professor Paul Johnson has been director of the IFS since January 2011, and he's also currently visiting professor in the Department of Economics at University College London. He's worked and published extensively on the economics of public policy, with a particular focus on income distribution, public finances, pensions, tax, social security, education, and climate change. He has also worked in Britain's Treasury, the Department for Education, and the Financial Services Authority. Between 2004 and 2007, he was deputy head of the Government Economic Service. Paul is currently also a member of the Committee on Climate Change, the Banking Standards Board, 
uh, and of the Executive Committee of the Royal Economic Society. He was an editor of the Merleys Review, I don't know whether I've pronounced that correctly, Merleys Review of the UK tax system. And tonight he's going to talk to us about choices in public policy. We're very fortunate to have Professor Paul Johnson with us this evening. Please welcome him to deliver the 2018 Joseph Fisher Lecture. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much indeed for that, um, uh, that introduction. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation to come and speak. It's a privilege to follow such a distinguished uh, set of speakers. I hope I don't let you down too much on this um, Thursday evening. Um, I, I wanted to talk a bit about this rather broad topic of making uh, choices in public policy for uh, a number of reasons. First, I've spent the last 30 years of my life doing work in the economics of public policy, either doing research and advising governments on what might make good public policy, or indeed working in government and helping to advise governments on what might make good policy. Um, we've also uh, recently, as you're mostly, I hope, aware, made some quite big choices in the UK about the future uh, of our country, uh, coming out of the European Union uh, prime among them. And as economists, we really ought to have something to say about how those choices um, should be made. Uh, and I think we do. Uh, but what I'm not going to do, you'll be delighted to hear, is uh, give you a lecture about cost-benefit analysis. Uh, and exactly uh, the techni techniques that one might use. I'm going to take a slightly uh, higher level view of some of these choices, and then I'm going to drill down into some specific issues and illustrate some of the choices that we face. They're inevitably very partial. There are choices in just about everything. Um, and whilst I was introduced as a, a critic of government and the opposition, as it were, and I am a, a critic of government, um, I also uh, want to sort of display a little sympathy uh, for government in talking about this because making these choices is staggeringly hard. Uh, and I think we, as the public, as businesses, as individuals, as voters, very rarely understand quite how hard those choices are. Now, it's partly politicians' fault because they don't tend to um, tell us how hard it is. They tend to be very clear about what the right answer is. They tend to be very certain uh, about what the right answer is. And they tend to be clear uh, that the uh, right answer will help everybody. And that's almost never true. And one of the reasons for talking about this is that um, one of the most famous phrases um, in recent British political history, used in the Brexit debate by the man who is currently our Foreign Secretary and uh, my namesake, but not a relative, Boris Johnson, uh, was that leaving the European Union, we could have our cake and eat it. That you could have everything. You could have all the benefits of being in the EU and a whole bunch of benefits beside. And that, I'm afraid, is rather how a lot of political discourse occurs. Uh, make this choice and we'll all be uh, better off in one way or another. I'm afraid that's almost never true. We have to make choices across whole ranges of things. Are we worried about national income, about inequality? This group of people or that group of people? The present or the future? The environment, health, education, this business, that business? There are winners and losers almost always. Um, that should be obvious. It's not obvious uh, listening to many of our politicians. I'm going to focus on those uh, trade-offs. But I also want to talk about uncertainty. Uncertainty is pervasive in making policy. We rarely know what the, even if we've decided which of those trade-offs we're going to make, that we want to make, we rarely know precisely how to make them. Something very straightforward, increasing a rate of tax. Do we really know how much that will raise? Do we really know what the impact that will have on people's behaviour? Well, we at the IFS and no doubt people in the School of Economics here in Adelaide study that, and we can give you some idea about the impact of many policies, uh, but we can't give you a precise idea. Now, politicians like precision. Uh, they don't like uncertainty. Uh, 
President Lyndon Johnson rather famously is supposed to have responded to an economist, some poor economist telling him that he didn't know the answer, but he'd give him a range of answers. To which uh, President Johnson replied, ranges are for cattle, give me a number. And that's again rather how, not just politicians, uh, but, but all of us like to see the world. We want certainty and we rarely have certainty. We can be fairly sure about some things. We are sure about the direction of change. We can be fairly sure, I think, that climate change, for example, is happening, but we can't be certain about exactly how much it's happening. I think we can be fairly sure that the UK leaving the European Union will make us economically worse off, but I don't know how much worse off than we otherwise would have been. And when you can't give those numbers, very often people mistake that sort of uncertainty, so uncertainty about the quantity for a qualitative uncertainty, uncertainty about the direction, because we like to focus on the specific. And if you can't give something specific, often we don't believe uh, what's really going to happen. So let me start with one of my um, uh, particular examples. By the way, if you want to follow me on Twitter, there's my, uh, there's my Twitter um, account. It's very exciting stuff on there, lots of stuff from, uh, from, the, uh, from the IFS. Um, uh, let me start by uh, talking about one specific uh, example uh, from the UK. I'm afraid that most of my examples are going to be taken from the UK, but I think they are fairly generally um, relevant. Uh, this is um, uh, a graph of what's happened to productivity in the UK over the last uh, 20 years or so. So what that line is showing you is that productivity rose pretty, uh, pretty well couple of percent a year, year on year, through to the financial crisis in 2008. And essentially been doing something like that for the last 50 years. Gradually, productivity was rising. And then what you see from 2008 is that productivity has stopped rising. It's essentially been flat. Now, the UK is an extreme example of this, but this has been happening uh, fairly consistently across the world, that the, uh, the pr productivity has done less well since 2008 than it did before um, 2008, the UK, I'm afraid, really is a bit of an extreme example of that. Now, lots of uh, interesting uh, facts about this. I mean, this really matters, as, um, as, as, as Paul Krugman famously said, uh, productivity isn't the only thing that matters, but in the long run, it's almost uh, the only thing that matters because that determines how well off we are, the amount we produce without each hour that we work. Um, uh, but what I want to illustrate is the uncertainty about this. So that's what's happened. So what you have there, I don't know why some of those are grey and some are green, but that what you have there is a series of forecasts for what would happen uh, given by the Office of Budget Responsibility, which is the UK's independent fiscal watchdog. So what that's saying is that in 2010, uh, in, in spring 2010, in November 2010, in spring 2011, in November 2011, all the way through until last year, Essentially, their forecast was that productivity would return to its pre-crisis trend. So all of those lines which go off up were the, uh, were the forecasts, and the dark line uh, is what actually happened. So as you can see, the forecasts were wildly wrong, wildly um, optimistic. Now, this is not a criticism of the OBR. Um, they essentially thought, as most economists did, uh, that you know, the world hasn't changed so fundamentally, at some point, surely, uh, we will start growing as we uh, grew before um, 2008. And we haven't done. And government has to make policy on the basis of these forecasts. These forecasts underlie what the government thinks is going to happen to the deficit, what it thinks is going to happen to tax revenues, what it thinks is going to happen to people's earnings. And as it's turned out, things have turned out worse than expected year on year uh, on year. Yeah. Now, most recently, um, the OBR has decided to downgrade its forecast. So that grey line there is its most recent forecast. It still looks pretty optimistic relative to the post-crisis average, but pessimistic relative to the pre-crisis average. It basically takes the difference between the two trends. That's not how they describe how they got to that number. That's basically, uh, that's basically what it does. Um, uh, and, you know, that might be right, it might be wrong, it might be too optimistic, it might be too pessimistic, I don't know. But that is the basis on which the government is making its, uh, its fiscal policy. Um, so that sort of uncertainty is huge. There, there, there's another sort of uncertainty here, which is that the solid line might be wrong. Actually, measuring productivity is itself incredibly 
an uh, incredibly difficult thing to do, and in particular, uh, in a world in which we're moving towards uh, uh, an information-based economy, a service-based economy, one in which actually measuring output is more difficult, and one in which measuring price inflation is, is difficult. It may well be that we're overstating inflation, in which case real productivity may be rising faster uh, than it looks, and real earnings may be rising faster than they look. And I could give you a whole lecture on the uncertainty around that. So we are making policy, this is just one of many examples I could have provided, making policy in a fog of uncertainty, not just about the future, uh, but about the present. And indeed, if you read the memoirs of um, uh, chancellors of the Exchequer past, uh, they will, uh, they will uh, spend uh, much time uh, uh, worrying about that fact, bemoaning the fact that they are making policy, not just not knowing what's happening in the future, but really moaning at their statisticians and economists who couldn't even tell them what was happening at the time uh, that they were, uh, that they were making uh, that they were making uh, that they were making policy. The other thing uh, that is worth saying about productivity um, is that we actually know quite a lot about how to make it better, and we often decide not to. And that's a, uh, a, a rather good example of some of the trade-offs that are uh, uh, informally and uh, non-explicitly made as we make policy. So, in the UK, for example, we decide. Uh, not to uh, liberalise our planning rules and build more uh, housing around cities. We decide not to build more roads. Uh, we decide uh, not to put more money uh, into certain types of education, all of which would increase productivity and would make us better off. And many, but the point is that many of those things, building new runways, uh, taking tariffs off um, uh, imported goods, uh, building houses in uh, greenbelt areas, makes a small number of people a lot worse off and a large number of people a little bit better off. And that's, again, a very uh, typical problem in making choices in public policy in, in economics. There are a lot of things that we know, or fairly sure, will make everyone a little bit better off in the long run. But you can see absolutely clearly that make a small number of people a lot worse off in the short run. And one of the biggest um, issues in politics, in public policy, is, uh, is, is, is trading those things off. And very often, the way that governments trade them off is just by ignoring them, not talking about them, uh, not being clear that those are the trade-offs that are there. So I could spend all, uh, all evening talking about productivity, but I will, uh, I will move on uh, a little. Um, just another example of the uncertain world that we um, live in. Um, this chart shows you, again, for the UK, uh, what was happening to economic performance um, over the last 20 years or so. The green line is what actually happened. The dotted lines are forecasts. Now, the difference between those uh, today is about £300 billion. We have carelessly lost about 15% of the British economy relative to where we thought we would have been uh, back in uh, 2008 if growth had continued um, as expected. And just to prove that, um, back in 2008, just before the crisis, Alistair Darling, who was the Chancellor then, and actually a relatively sane and rational Chancellor by the standard of Chancellors, um, uh, said, uh, you know, I'm able to report the British economy will continue to grow through this year and beyond because of all the marvellous things uh, that government had done. Well, sadly, he was proved horribly, uh, horribly wrong. As I said, we've lost a large chunk of the economy relative to what we might reasonably uh, have expected back in 2008. Again, policy has had to adapt to that. And how has policy uh, adapted to that? Well, what I'm showing you here is spending, the top line, and taxes, the bottom line, as a fraction of national income. And as you can see, they diverged rather dramatically uh, back in 2010. We had a deficit of 10% um, of national income. And if, uh, if the most recent really big choice that the British government has made, or the British people have made, is to leave the European Union, if you look at the period before that, the big economic choice that government made was to reduce that deficit uh, at a relatively uh, speedy rate. And they did that essentially by bringing spending down um, as a fraction of national income from uh, the height that it reached in the, in, in the aftermath of the financial crisis. That, that was what that decision, that choice, um, uh, consumed British politics, actually, for the whole period up to the point at which uh, uh, Brexit consumed, started to consume British uh, 
politics. The decision to get the deficit down at a, at a relatively uh, speedy um, rate. Now, what you will see, though, and uh, we, we see this as having been eight years so far of austerity, eight years of bringing spending down as a fraction of national income. And what has that achieved? Well, you can see on that chart that has achieved getting spending down to its same level as a fraction of national income as it was in 2008 after 15 years or 12 years of uh, quite high spending Labour government. So the, um, the, the, the choice, in a sense, has not been to reduce the size of the state below uh, what it was in 2008. It's been to get it back down there. The cost of that, because uh, of the um, because of what's happened to the size of the economy, the cost of that has been really quite substantial. We still do have um, a deficit on which the government still focuses to a remarkable, um, a remarkable degree. So that's a big choice in public policy. What size should your state be? And what do you do with the spending within that? Well, look, there again is what's happened to the size of the state since 2008. It hasn't changed. You wouldn't, uh, the, 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 the uh, in, in, incredulity with which that statement is met in, in the UK is remarkable because we have lived through this long period of austerity, of public spending cuts, the likes of which we have not seen uh, ever actually in peacetime uh, in the UK. Uh, but, and, the, and the reason for that, again, is the underlying weakness of the economy. But within that, there have been a whole series of choices. We're spending actually a lot more on pension benefits and health over that period, and rather as a fraction of national income, more as a fraction of national income on pension benefits and health, and to some extent on overseas aid, and quite a lot less on things like defence, police, uh, education uh, than we were um, back, in, uh, back in 2008. Now, actually, that's a set of choices pretty consistent with the set of choices that have been made over a 60 or 70 year period. If you look over 70 years, Spending on pensions has risen as a fraction of national income. Spending on health has risen as a fraction of national income. Spending on defence has fallen uh, dramatically. Uh, defense, spending on um, housing, the spending on supporting industry has fallen over that period. Now, big choices going forward. The population, as I'm sure you are aware, in most countries is, is ageing. Uh, if we carry on with anything like current policies, the amount of money, the amount of national income spent on health and pensions in the UK, in Australia, in almost all other countries will rise uh, and will continue uh, to rise. At some point, we will either have to make the choice to have even more spending cuts in some of the areas where we've had spending cuts or to raise taxes at a reasonably to a reasonably significant degree. Do we have any kind of public conversation about that? No, we don't. Um, do we have the political parties laying out different ways of achieving that? No, we don't. There, there's no conversation of that of any kind. If we are in the UK to have a health service and a pension provision, something like we have at the moment in 30 years' time, it will take at least another 4%, at least another 4% of national, uh, a national income on very generous assumptions. The only way of achieving that will either be to raise taxes, and I suspect it will be raising taxes. It's not, I think, going to be finding even more to cut from elsewhere. And the UK is not particularly um, unusual uh, in that. So huge choices about which we have very little discussion. It's also interesting to see that we have quite different discussions about this in different sorts of countries. It is impossible to have a sensible discussion about health in the UK. Um, the idea of having a health system like the one that you have here, where most people have some private top-up, is completely beyond the political pale. Uh, pensions with private top-up, fine. Everyone needs a private top-up to their pension, but not health. Is there a good reason for that? Well, uh, there are some good economic reasons for that, but, uh, uh, but I'm not sure that's what underlies the state of our, um, uh, the state of our debate. So, so big choices there and a very poor debate about it. Now, there's another set of choices here, be even bigger ones, which is what is the size of the state overall? This just, take, this just taken from OECD figures. This just shows you the scale of choices that different countries make about the size of their states. Public spending is a fraction of national 
income. You see they, rise, they, they range from more than half of national income going on public spending uh, to uh, around 20% of national income. That's a vast array. And there are successful economies at the top of that chart, and there are successful economies at the bottom uh, of that chart. Now, you would think, talking to people on either side of politics, that it is impossible uh, to spend as much as France or Finland or Belgium or Denmark spends and have an effective, well-functioning economy. But they've got reasonably effective, well-functioning economies. Uh, look down towards the bottom, Ireland, Switzerland, the US, they've got much lower levels of spending. They've also got reasonably well-functioning um, economies. The choices there are actually much more important about how you spend the money and how you raise the taxes uh, in terms of having a functioning economy than it is how much you do. Now, I've put in the uh, UK, I mean, if, if you, Australia on there is just below the, uh, the blue line, one below, uh, one below that. The red and blue lines are the choices that we had last year in 2016, sorry, 2017 in our most recent general election. And that's about 4 four or 5% of national income difference between the two main parties in terms of what they had in their manifestos. That's quite a big, that's quite a big choice. Um, uh, but that's just to illustrate that those choices, nevertheless, leave you very much within the range of other, uh, of other countries in terms of what they do. What, though, the, not, neither of them were doing was telling us anything about how they would deal with the long-term uh, challenges that we uh, very, clearly, uh, very clearly face. Now, Australia has chosen a relatively low tax route. Now, I've spoken to one or two people who are surprised by that because they think they pay a lot of tax. Uh, but by international standards, Australia is a relatively uh, low tax uh, country overall. Now, how has it achieved that? It's essentially because it spends less on transfers, pensions and welfare benefits, and in particular, uh, pension benefits than many other countries. And that's because of the big choices you've made about how you fund your pension system. You've got a, a big, as you know, compulsory private system and a means-tested um, public system. Uh, which gives you this remarkable uh, chart, again, an OECD chart showing uh, that Australia is much more targeted, much more targeted in its transfer payments than almost any other country. And that really reflects the fact that its pension system is very targeted. You see the ones at the far end uh, where there's not much difference between the richest and the poorest. That's because very large amounts of transfer, public transfer payments are going to relatively uh, well-off pensioners. Now, again, there are clearly trade-offs within that uh, in terms of the um, uh, choices that the government's making, the incentives that people are having to save, but also the costs. Whilst what I showed you was uh, public spending as a fraction of national income, clearly compulsory saving today is making people worse off today and better off uh, tomorrow. And again, we could spend a lot of time talking about the way that pension systems uh, work uh, in terms of those choices. Now, let me run through a couple of other issues before uh, um, moving towards uh, the end. Now, as big as ever, big choices about the way that you structure um, tax systems. Uh, one of the frustrations for me as someone who works on tax a lot is that tax is as big as spending. Well, it isn't quite as big as spending because we've got a deficit, but tax is almost as big as spending, about four pounds in every 10 in the UK, a bit less than that in Australia that people earn uh, in the economy goes um, in tax. We don't spend enough time talking about what the right way of doing that is. And who pays that uh, tax really matters. And again, there is a huge amount of um, uh, ignorance among politicians as well as among the public about who pays that tax. So if we just look at income tax, if everyone paid the same income tax, each 1% of the population from the poorest to the richest would each pay 1% of income tax. Well, 40% don't pay any income tax at all because their incomes are too low. Uh, the next, um, but the bottom half of taxpayers only pay 10% of income tax. The next 40% pay 30%. And when you get to the 1% of income taxpayers, they pay a quarter of all income tax. Now, I'm going to show you that this is same, basically the same is true in Australia as is true uh, in the UK. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, two reasons. The first is that I find that chart quite scary, because that means we are incredibly dependent on a very small number of people for a very large chunk of the money that pays for public services. 
and that means that we uh, need to be incredibly careful about them. But it also means, uh, why, why are they paying all that tax? Because they've got so much money. They're incredibly rich. That's why they've got a, they're paying such a high fraction of tax. So this is also an indication, one of many indications I could uh, give you, of how unequal the income distribution is in the UK and in many other countries. And we also have choices about that income distribution. Let me give, me, let me give you one fact about the UK. Over the 2000s, um, earnings inequality rose quite significantly um, in the UK. Household income inequality did not. And why didn't household income inequality rise? It's because we chose to spend uh, many tens of billions of pounds actually extra on, uh, on welfare benefits for low-income people in work. We made a choice in the 2000s to keep inequality down. And actually, uh, we've made a choice in the period since then to keep inequality down by raising the amount of tax, particularly that we get from people at the top um, of the distribution. What the long-term consequences of all that will be, again, I think we don't, uh, we don't know. But what I do know is that this chart is not well understood uh, by most people. Uh, they don't understand, first of all, quite how well off the top 1% are, who's in the top 1%, and they certainly don't understand how very dependent they are on the tax revenues that we get uh, from uh, that group. Um, and just to show you that Australia isn't so different, this is taken from your uh, tax authority um, website. Um, just uh, looking at one bit on each of those, this, uh, um, the, uh, on the left hand, uh, as you look at its side, you can see that small group, 3% of people earning more than $180,000. Uh, on the right hand side, 30% of income tax revenues from that very small group of people. So the picture in Australia is really quite similar uh, to the picture in the UK in terms of dependence on a small number of, uh, of, of, of relatively um, high income, uh, relatively high income people. And you have the same set of choices uh, about the level of inequality uh, that you want. But of course, with trade-offs about who's going to win and who's going to lose from any of the policies that you make. And in particular, uncertain trade-offs about what impacts that might have on growth in the future. I'm going to talk about two other um, issues. OK, there's a chart um, with a line on it. Uh, this is a, um, and, and uh, this, this, this illustrates the impact of the biggest policy that the Labour Party opposition in the UK put to the electorate uh, in 2017, last year. So what this would have done for the poorest was nothing at all. And what this would have done for the richest is to make them off better off by about 80 or 100,000 pounds. And this was the most popular policy that the Labour Party put forward. Um, you probably guess what that is. That's abolishing student tuition fees for university graduates. So actually, this is a rather generous way of putting it because that's just for university graduates. So because of the way that the income contingent loan system is designed in the UK, it's sort of similar to Australia. It's not, it's not the same. Because of the way that the income contingent loan system is constructed in the UK, if you're a graduate who doesn't earn very much, you basically don't pay anything back. If you earn a lot, you pay an awful lot back. So if you abolish tuition fees, uh, you make um, the best off graduates uh, much better off and the worst off graduates doesn't help and obviously if you're not a graduate it doesn't help. Now this is not um, saying that that's the wrong policy but it's just an illustration of uh, a choice uh, that you would make with public money. And that choice made in a way uh, which um, completely I think uh, uh, defeats the, the facts. It, is, it, it tends to be described as, is university tuition going to be free or are you going to have to pay for it? Well, of course, someone has to pay for it. The point is, at the moment, it's rich graduates who pay for it, with about half of it being paid for taxpayers. If you abolish tuition fees, it just all gets paid by taxpayers. Someone's paid for it. It's not free. It's just that someone different pays for it. And that's not, obviously, how the uh, policy is described. It's not, it's not described as a choice between... Um, rich graduates paying and the taxpayer in general paying, it's, it's described as students not paying and it being free. And of course that is not an honest way of describing any kind of, uh, any kind of policy choice. Um, uh, whether, you know, whether, whether, whether that is the right 
system or not is, uh, you know, is again, um, you, well, you, those who have been uh, to previous uh, Fisher lectures will have heard Bruce Chapman talk about, uh, uh, talk about that in a great deal more detail. I'm going to finish with a rather different uh, kind of example and choice uh, in uh, public policy. Um, so actually, let me say, one, one, one argument, I think, one strong argument for, uh, I think possibly the best argument for abolishing student fees and leaving the population at large to pay for it is an intergenerational one. So I didn't pay any student fees when I went to university 30 something years ago. Um, and uh, I'm paying less for the current generation because they're going in the future to be paying for themselves. So if there is an unfairness here, it arguably is an intergenerational unfairness, a, a, an unfairness between young people going to university today and young people who went to university, or people who were young people who went to university uh, 30 years um, ago. And I just want to say something about this, I think, really tough question 10 minutes, yeah, I can finish in 10, probably less. Um, this really tough question about intergenerational um, inequality and how to think about that. Because, uh, and I'll just illustrate this, we, we have, a, we, we, we have a, a remarkable generational shift um, uh, in the UK over the last 40 years. When I started work in public policy in the 1980s, um, poverty, uh, was concentrated among people over uh, state pension age. Uh, their incomes were much lower on average than people below pension age, and they were not a particularly well-off group. That has shifted completely. Uh, pensioners, in 2011, something remarkable happened in the UK, the average income of people over, over pension age, once you take account of housing costs and child, costs of children, the average income of people over state pension age was higher for the first time in history than the average income of people below pension age, quite an extraordinary change. But even more importantly, for a series of reasons largely to do with political choices and I think mistakes, uh, we have a generation who have done extraordinarily well um, in terms of their wealth uh, in a way that the younger generation will not, or extremely uh, unlikely uh, that they will. Let me, let me just um, illustrate one of them before I talk a little bit about, more about the others and then say something why, why I think this is such a tough choice, or such a tough issue in public policy. So what I'm going to show you here is something about rates of owner-occupation, housing owner-occupation uh, by age and cohort. So this shows you what fraction of people born in the 1930s uh, were owner-occupiers at particular ages. So if you're born in the 1930s, by the time you got to 30, about half of people born in the 1930s owned their own house. By the time they got to 60, that had risen to about three quarters. So that's people born in the 1930s. So as you'd expect, as you go through time, later generations, better off, more likely to be owner-occupiers. Big shift up, people born in the 1940s, a shift up at younger ages, people born in the 1950s, 1960s. Uh, 1970s, way down. People born in the 1980s, they look remarkably like people born in the 1930s. We've had a collapse in home ownership among younger generations um, in the UK. People born in the 1980s are about half as likely uh, to be homeowners by the age of 30 uh, than people born in, the 19, um, born in the 1960s. Now, that line will almost certainly go up to a level uh, above the 1930s uh, by the time people get to 45 and 50, but it seems to be highly unlikely it will reach um, the high levels of home ownership we saw among people born in the uh, 40s and 50s by the time they get uh, to retirement age. So that's just one example. In addition, uh, we've had a move from um, a, large a large minority of people having generous defined benefit occupational pensions to one in which only literally only public sector workers, uh, and actually not even university professors anymore until since a couple of months ago, have these defined benefit occupational pensions. So we have a set, we have a, a generation whose uh, home ownership is much lower, who have access to much less generous uh, pension schemes, and uh, possibly even more importantly, who have lived through um, the financial crisis, very low interest rates, they can't access uh, money for housing, uh, 
Uh, they're also not getting any returns on their savings. They will highly likely end up with lower levels of wealth than their parents. So uh, this is just the average wealth, putting all of that together. Uh, someone born in the 1980s at age 30 had about half the wealth of someone born in the 1970s uh, at the same age. So why, why does all this matter for making choices? Well, if you want to redistribute um, from what's turned out to be a very lucky generation, have been lucky because of the way that defined benefit occupations were taxed, because of the way uh, that they were funded, because of the way that they're regulated. Um, if you're lucky in terms of what's happened to your housing, what's happened to the value of your house, what's happened to the interest you're paying on uh, that house. Now, you've been lucky, but you've done all the right stuff. You've made the choices given the tax system that you faced. You made the choices given um, the advice that you were given by government. You've done everything right. You've just ended up being really quite well off relative to the generation below. So is it right or reasonable to tax you or to change uh, to change policy to take some of that back retrospectively? Um, and that's a question I want to leave you with, as I think one of the biggest choices that governments have to make. What is reasonable in public policy uh, when it comes to retrospection? So uh, your house quintupled in value, but there's no capital gains tax on your house. Is it reasonable ex post to raise a capital gains tax on, 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 on what you've uh, got back? Your pension has turned out to be much more expensive than was ever imagined. Is it reasonable to start raising a tax uh, on that pension? Now, most people's intuition is no, it's not. And I think there's a very strong reason for that intuition, which is that we have very strong property rights. Uh, and to undermine property rights is a very dangerous thing. Uh, and to undermine legitimate expectations is a dangerous thing. But we also need to think very carefully about what we mean by retrospection. We don't tend to think similarly about raising say value-added tax, your uh, GST. You might not like re raising GST. We don't have the same, um, we don't have quite the same uh, moral objection to it. Uh, but actually, it's not so different because if I've, you know, if I've earned money in the expectation of being able to buy a certain amount with it, and then you raise my tax on what I buy, you've made me worse off just as surely as if you'd raised your tax on my pension. Um, if you increase taxes, higher rate taxes, I've worked really hard to earn £200,000 a year. If you then suddenly increase my rate of income tax, that's kind of retrospective as well. I, I expected to be able to take home 150000 and now you say I can only take home 130000 So the difference between what is and what isn't retrospective uh, is much less clear uh, than I think is often uh, given credit for. So hey, all I've done is, is, is set out three or four kinds of choices that I think about, and I could have talked about a lot more in terms of welfare, in terms of climate change, particularly big questions in climate change. Even if you take uh, as, as certain that climate change is happening, that tells you almost nothing about what the appropriate choice is in terms of uh, making policy in that area. Making choices in education and health and, and all so many other places uh, are, so, are so hard. But let, let me let me return to uh, where I started, uh, and just to illustrate that uh, whilst Boris Johnson may not uh, know uh, what he's talking about, um, uh, uh, the, um, we've known for centuries uh, that, uh, that our choices have to be made. This is, this is a, a genuine quote uh, from 1538, the Duke of Norfolk writing uh, to Cro Thomas Cromwell explaining he's got less money than he had, he knew that a man cannot have his cake and eat his cake. And it's time that our politicians, at least, understood what was understood uh, 500 years ago. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Paul, for a very stimulating and thought-provoking talk. <laughs> I've been sitting there wishing to raise questions and contentions all the way through, but I'm going to leave that privilege to the audience. We're going to have a few minutes now of questions and answers, so if anybody would like to ask a question, please go ahead. You'll, you'll have to shout, I'm afraid. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, 
There was a large focus on individuals' taxation and uh, how that's changed and how spending uh, is then affected by it. Um, I know at least in America, in the 70s, business paid 20% of the tax income out of paid 2%. Um, is there a large, with the lucky generations, is there another way that you could possibly do redistribution uh, that would not uh, inspire the ire of old people and uh, <laughs> set their heart of cash? Uh, um, possibly. I mean, it's uh, slightly worrying when Gareth, uh, so let me start by responding to Gareth, he said it was stimulating the thought provoking, which I think means you've disagreed with quite a lot of what I said. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Um, uh, is, is there a way of doing it in a way that doesn't um, get, I mean, there, there might be, and I think maybe what you're guessing at is that um, you know, who owns the, uh, who, 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 who owns a lot of business, for example, it's, you know, it's through pension funds, quite a lot of it. Uh, it's, it's, it's owned by people who are, on average, relatively well off. You could uh, increase taxes on corporations in the hope of getting some of that back, and that might uh, work to some extent. It's very important to recognise that there is no such thing, in a sense, as a tax on business. It's always either paid by the customer, the employee, or the owner. Um, and if it's paid by the owner, and the owner is uh, you know, the relatively well off, then in a fairly an extremely untransparent way, uh, you, might, uh, you, you might get some of that back. There's, wh whether it is paid by the owner or whether it's paid by the employee uh, is pretty uncertain. There's, uh, there is conflicting um, evidence on that, I think it would be fair to say. Personally, as a sort of rather naive economist, I prefer taxes that are transparent in terms of their, uh, their incidence, but I'm increasingly being uh, persuaded that that's just a rather naive view and that the more that we can fool people, the better. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Further questions? Yes? In light of your 30 years' experience of public policy and presenting to politicians, uh, what can you say about uh, how the conversation has changed in the sense of uh, how better or worse are economists at presenting these arguments to politicians and how better or worse are politicians at listening or receiving these arguments? Oh gosh, that's a hard, uh, a hard question. I mean, there's, um, I mean, there are, I mean, there are, I'm afraid, um, quite a lot of uh, you, things that haven't changed. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the hubris of politicians has not, uh, has not changed enormously. We had a chancellor in the 1980s called Nigel Lawson, uh, and another one in the 2000s called Gordon Brown. Uh, and whilst they would uh, they would they would uh, be appalled at any comparison, uh, they were both very similar in thinking they both solved all problems in economics and had sorted out uh, the British economy. So the hubris uh, of politicians has not uh, has not changed very much. Um, the, I mean, the quantity of economic advice they're getting has certainly gone up. The size of the British government economic service is probably at least five times as big as it was in the 1980s. Whether that's been uh, made policy five times better, I, uh, I, I rather doubt. Um, the, I mean, the things that have got better is the, I mean, the da data and information and evidence is much more available. Uh, the, the, the sorts of research that we can do, for example, at the Institute for Fiscal Studies is much more um, substantial uh, than, it, uh, than it was. Uh, but that also puts on us a fair, you know, it put, puts on those using that data a huge responsibility to use it and communicate it uh, in the most effective way uh, that they can, which we try to do, uh, but you know, the, the public debate is it, it's a competitive market. I mean, there is a lot of um, stuff out there. Some of it's good and some of it isn't. Uh, and uh, I was talking um, to, I mean, to Gareth earlier, actually, about the role of um, uh, the, the economics profession in regulating itself, in a sense, or the Royal Economic Society, uh, and whether it could have a role. And I don't know quite how it would do it in uh, in, in doing more to uh, communicate. So I think I think I think economists have a great deal more to do. The, I mean, the, the one thing I would say um, is that the one thing that really changed uh, debate was having a referendum um, in the UK. In fact, two referendums: uh, one for Scottish independence uh, and one uh, for uh, leaving the U European Union. Both of those were appalling. Uh, examples of how to make public policy and appalling examples of public uh, public debate. Uh, 
Uh, and I would not recommend uh, referendums on serious issues. Um, whether, you consider, whether you consider the Queen as head of state as a serious issue, I'll leave to you. But, um, uh, but, uh, but, but on serious issues, I really would not recommend them because they definitely make uh, debate much worse because it has to be, it's a one-shot game. It's a completely one-shot game. So you can behave as badly uh, as you like. You can, uh, you know, I'm talking about both sides here, you can lie as completely as you like uh, and you can claim, you can have your cake and eat it, that everything will be marvellous inside the EU or everything will be marvellous outside the EU or inside the UK or outside the UK. And then you have to pick up the pieces um, afterwards. And in my professional life, uh, much the worst part of it actually was dealing with those two referendums because getting serious objective analysis across uh, it, it, in a way that was taken seriously and objectively uh, was much harder than in any other point. Thank you very much. Oh, Litzer has a question. Oh, four minutes. Oh, four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Are there any further questions before I start talking about Brexit? Uh, uh, that must, uh, that a must question, yeah, surely. incur somebody with a question to ask. No? Okay. Well, in that case, I will thank you very profusely for a really interesting, stimulating, <laughs> informative, <laughs> and excellent lecture. It's been great entertainment and a pleasure to host you here. And thank you for visiting the University of Adelaide. Well, thank you very much for having me.